Hello, and welcome to today's presentation of Greet the Week. I am Mona Duncan, and today's topic is on learning styles and uh, the way that we learn and the way that we incorporate things has a lot to do with how well they stay with us. And I was just sitting here looking over the little plaque that I have on the wall and it says to teach is to touch lives forever. And I was just sitting here thinking about all of the teachers in my life that have been legitimate canceled teachers and those that are just teachers of their own personality and who they are. So our primary learning styles are through visual, through auditory, the, thing, the things that we hear, and then through kinesthetics, as in the things that we act out on. And so it really takes a little bit of all of those to get to know who we are or the way that we see things and the way that we learn things, how we learn. Well, there is an institution, Briggs Myers Foundation, that for years has a long history in doing, in testing individuals to learn the innate personality of a person and to come up with and kind of to label positives and negatives. And um, the overriding goal is for self-improvement. You know, to accentuate, as Jiminy Cricket sang in one of the Disney cartoons, that to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. And don't mess with Mr. In-Between. However, the more we can come to a middle ground, the more we have a big leeway in expressing who we are and in... Um, and so the overriding goal is for self-improvement to see in the questionnaire from the Myers-Briggs that it comes out there supposedly 16 personality types. And I think about that. I think about, wow, all 7.9 billion people on planet Earth, do we all have a mixture of only 16 characteristics? And yet, the more I think about that, the more I kind of realize that I see us as being more alike than we are different. That we all want basically the same things. And that is to love and belong, to have the power, to have strength, to have a say-so, to be important, to uh, do things that help others. And so in those 16 personality types, and into all of these different things, the questionnaires that come from the Briars and Briggs, they are sorted into strengths. And we answer, they give questions and you answer questions and it comes out as to whether that strength is dominant, as to whether it is an auxiliary, something that kind of fills in the gap every once in a while, whether it is tertiary, where it is something that is a part of the DNA, but it is undeveloped and therefore it's rather awkward, or is it something that is inferior? And uh, that inferior, Carl Jung looks at it as being the shadow. And the shadow, he defines it as the shadow side is composed of personality traits rejected for the sake of the ego's ideal. And if it doesn't quite measure up to what we want to, think we are or be or who we are, then it becomes a shadow side of us that sometimes shows up. Well, in the Myers-Briggs, they have uh, a base on either side. And in those bases, there are a lot of different uh, weights. One of the ranges to looking at is to how do we orient to life? Or what is our energy like? And it's whether it's in being an extrovert or an introvert. And the extrovert, of course, is the one that is more into the um, loving and belonging and wanting to know about things as opposed to the introvert. Not that either one, not that one is better than another. It is just as what is the inherent propensity that we lean to. 
Another of the ranges is looking at the processing of information. Do we do it through our senses, through what we see, hear, taste, touch, smell, or do we do it through intuitive? Is it something that's kind of an inward knowing that uh, you can't really maybe have an exact answer for? It's more intuitive. And it looks at how we govern the decision making of life, or how do we decide things? Is it through what we think, or is it through what we feel? And each of those can have, they have their merits. They also, each of these eight qualifiers have their detractions. And then it's also looking at the overall view of life and its orientation. Or the pace. How do we, how do we pace ourselves in life? And one way is through judging, and one way is through perception. And the kind of, the judging reminds me of the, the question the rabbi asked a couple of weeks ago when he was looking at that he asked his students is how can you determine when the nighttime has turned in, it's the dawning of the day. And uh, one student suggested it's whenever you could look outside and see an animal in the distance and determine that it was a dog as opposed to a goat. And uh, the rabbi said, no, that's not it. And another one spoke up and said, well, maybe it's whenever you can look at the trees and you can tell that, it's, that you can see if it's a fig tree or an apple tree. And no, uh, and several other students wanted to know, well, how, how can you tell, how can you tell? And his answer was, whenever you can tell that the being is your brother or your sister as opposed to someone that is other. So it's looking at the overall view of life. It's the pace. It's our orientation of it. Is it to be judging that this is the way it is, or is it to be more perceptive of that is the way that I see it? And so as we look at those and go into looking at so just some random thoughts on learning and how we learn, I suggest that we are all seeking identity, position, purpose, significance, and validation. And we do that through a variety of ways. And as we change, that we change as our environment changes. The people that we're around, the, the things that we engage in, everything has an impact on us from one direction or another. And that life happens through us more than it does to us. It happens through the thoughts we think. It happens through the actions that we take. And then I'm wondering, has anyone ever made you do anything that you did not want to do? Or did we give in? That under pressure, under temptation, under allure, under being egged on, do we do things that we really don't want to do because the love and belonging, because the power, because the strength is um, too weighty? And in giving in, did you diminish your identity, your position, your purpose, your significance? and the need to be validated. But the point of it is, is are you okay right now? In looking at who we are, in looking at past circumstances, are you okay right now? And how can we live and be in the now? I find that habit creeps up on most of us. That, uh, we just get used to doing things over and over and they begin to take on a life of their own, whether that is an addiction, whether it is a disregard, whether it is a criminal activity even. And sometimes we let it just creep upon us because we have this faulty thinking of, I can handle it. That, uh, and so how long we can live in the now that always is without slipping back 
into the past or projecting into the future or the thinking of I like what Joel Osteen says he said that whatever follows your I am thinking comes looking for you and it goes back up to the range of you know why, why Myers-Briggs was formulated and why so many people go to it is to find out who we are and how we can self-improve but whatever follows our I am thinking comes looking for us. That whatever we're thinking is, whether it is positive or whether it's negative, because those emotions are very prevalent and they're very powerful. So how do we live in the now that always is? What keeps us in the now? Well, I suggest that it's action and that it's awareness that it's continually like realizing what am I doing now? What am I thinking now? And how is it keeping me in the present? It is to train our creative mind to know our true identity. That it, as we know our true identity and who we really are, we get an okay as opposed to an oh no. And it's something that resonates within us. It's something that's always letting us know. It is having more peace and less anger. It is as we are being true to ourselves. Again, as Shakespeare had one of his characters to say, to thine own self be true. And it follows as surely as night follows day. You cannot be false with any other man. You cannot be false with anyone else when you are true to you. And uh, that we begin to work on who we are and to any changes that we want from the inside out. And so, just as a little thought here, it's kind of five challenges that I continually take for me and make suggestions for you. That is to give up control, especially when it seems unreasonable to do so. That just to keep on, keep on keeping on trying to do it your way, your way, your way, to just give up that control, to just relinquish it. That what do you do when your back is up against the wall? Kind of put your hands up. And I have had people start to, you know, want to argue, oh, no, 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 that's not the way to work. But yet it's just that giving up control, especially when it seems unreasonable to do so. Well, maybe so, maybe no. You may be right, you may not be right. I may be right, I may not be right. But you know what? I'm just going to give it up. I'm going to give it up. I'm not going to pursue it. Uh, it's accepting responsibility for your choices, your attitudes, your behavior. And that goes back up with giving up that control of trying to be right, of trying to prove, of trying to it's being responsible for your thoughts. Well, I thought that would work. I thought it was that way. You know, your attitude toward the other person that you're working with, the other people, or the others in the family, and your behavior. You see, it is no longer you made me. It's owning our own choices. I chose to become frustrated. I chose to become. And there may be some really legitimate thing behind it, but it's as we search through who we are and we allow those emotions to come up and we write them down and we look and to see how legitimate they are. Um, another challenge is to develop gentleness in all areas. Just to be gentle. Instead of making a statement, make it in a more acceptable manner. In one that would be just just begin to look for gentleness. What is it? How do you identify gentleness? And how can you act on being gentle? And what is the resulting effects of it? It's just a way of kind of getting to know you. To be willing to look like a fool. To be willing to, you know, whether people say, what in the world was she thinking about? What was he thinking about? And um, to just be willing be okay with other people not 
being in agreement with is being willing to look like a fool while being true to yourself, to be true to you. That, uh, I mean, it may be something as simple as crying at a Kleenex commercial. But you know what? If that really touched you and it brought a tear to your eye and other, if others even call you names or a big crybaby or whatever, it's okay. Be willing to be, to look like a fool in order to be true to who you are or who you are becoming. And then get any anger or any frustration, that energy, get it out in a positive way to uh, mow the yard, clean out the garage, do some kind of work, physical work that works it out of the muscles rather than letting that anger get into the bloodstream that then flows into every organ in the body and begins to deteriorate and break down because what we we are what we eat. We are what we think. We are what we do. We, we, what we think materializes and it becomes something, whether it is a sickness or whether it is health, whether it is broken relationships or whether it is healthy relationships. So it's getting that anger out in positive ways. And it is through, you know, hitting a punching bag, but certainly never anyone else, but getting busy, moving the furniture. So just in looking at this, I want to finish it off with a, uh, a poem, a saying that Sir Lauren Vanderpost from Hastings Slowly, which was a film by Mickey LeMay. And the ending of it goes, there is nothing wrong with searching for happiness, but a far more comfort to the soul is something greater than a happiness or an unhappiness. And that is meaning. Because meaning transfigures all. Once you are doing, once what you are doing has for you meaning, it is irrelevant whether you're happy or unhappy, you're content. You are not alone in your spirit, you belong. And that is the greatest learning that we can have, is learning who we are. And learning that we belong and that we have a reason in life. We have a purpose in life. And so thank you for being here and uh, many blessings and good mental health.